All right, thanks very much, Matt. Thanks for inviting me and for the introduction. I spoke at uh, this meeting last year, and I turned that talk into a paper which uh, has been published and is also available in the archive. In this talk, I'm going to reprise uh, last year's talk in the first half, and if you want a more extended version of that, uh, you can look up the paper. Another recommended reading is this recently re released report from the National Academy, just released last week, which covers some of the same territory in greater detail and is also accessible and uh, interesting. Now, in last year's talk, I emphasized quantum computing, which is the main interests of many of the people in the room, and didn't say very much about some of the other ways in which quantum meets business, such as protecting our privacy by making use of the quantum laws of physics, distributing entanglement around the world, and using quantum technology for improved sensing. So this year, I would like to say something about those topics in the second half of the talk. Now, I'm a physicist, and to a physicist, the way I think we should look at quantum information science is we're in the initial stages of the exploration of a new frontier of the physical sciences, what we could call the complexity frontier or entanglement frontier. We are just developing and perfecting the ability to create and precisely control very complex, very highly entangled states of many particles, states so complex that we can't simulate them with our most powerful digital computers or describe their properties very well using existing theoretical tools, and that opens new opportunities for discovery. If you want to explore the structure of matter at shorter distances, you make a more powerful particle accelerator. If you want to explore the early history of the universe, you make a more powerful instrument or telescope. And if you want to explore the properties of highly entangled matter more deeply, you make a more powerful quantum computer or quantum simulator. Now, our conviction that this frontier is profitable to explore rests on two fundamental ideas, quantum complexity, which is our basis for thinking that quantum computing is powerful, and quantum error correction, which is our basis for thinking that quantum computing can be scaled up to large devices that solve hard problems. When we speak of quantum complexity, uh, what we have in mind, what springs to mind is the staggering complexity of describing using classical data highly entangled states of many particles. If I wanted to write down a complete description of all the correlations among just a few hundred qubits in some typical highly entangled state, I'd have to write down more numbers than the number of atoms in the visible universe, and that's never going to be possible. But that complexity in itself doesn't assure that quantum computers will be able to give us advantages for solving problems we care about. We have three types of reasons for thinking that quantum computing is powerful. One is that we know of problems which are believed to be hard for classical computers, but for which efficient quantum algorithms have been found. Finding the prime factors of large composite integers is the best known example. And we think that's a hard problem because very smart people for decades have been trying to find better factoring algorithms, but still, the best algorithms that we have have a runtime that scales super polynomially in the number of digits in the number to be factored. The theoretical computer scientists have also provided arguments based on plausible assumptions that you can execute a modest sized quantum computation and measure all the qubits, and in doing so, you're sampling from a probability distribution that can't be sampled from efficiently by any classical means. But perhaps the best reason we think that quantum computers will be powerful is that we don't know how to simulate a quantum computer using a classical computer. And it's not for lack of trying. Physicists have been trying for decades to 
come up with better methods for simulating the behavior of highly entangled states of many particles, but still the best algorithms that we have have a runtime in hard instances which increases exponentially with the number of particles or the number of qubits. We shouldn't think that the power of quantum computing is unlimited, and in particular, we don't expect that quantum computers will be able to find exact solutions to worst-case instances of NP-hard combinatorial optimization problems. So it's really, I think, one of the most remarkable and interesting things that's ever been said about the difference between classical physics and quantum physics that we believe there are problems which are too hard to solve with classical computers but can be solved efficiently with quantum computers. And so it's a compelling question to understand better what are these problems which are classically hard and quantumly easy. And if you're a physicist, there's a natural place to look. Two great physicists some years ago, Bob Laughlin and David Pines, pointed out that we really have a theory of everything that we care about in ordinary, everyday life, which underlies all of chemistry and biology. It's the theory of electrons interacting electromagnetically with atomic nuclei. And we can write down precisely the equations of that theory, but they're too hard to solve. So they went so far as to say no computer existing or that will ever exist can break this barrier. We've succeeded in reducing all of ordinary physical behavior to a simple, correct theory of everything, only to discover that it has revealed exactly nothing about many things of great importance. And those things of great importance that Laughlin and Pines had in mind are situations in which quantum entanglement has an underlying role. Now, in fact, years before Laughlin and Pines made this statement, Richard Feynman had articulated a rebuttal when he said, nature isn't classical, damn it, and if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical, and by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. So Feynman envisioned using quantum computers to solve quantum problems, and to a physicist, what's really exciting about quantum computing is that we expect that with a quantum computer, we'd be able to efficiently simulate any process that occurs in nature. We don't think that's true of our classical digital computers, which can't efficiently simulate very highly entangled matter. So with a quantum computer, we should be able to probe more deeply into the properties of complex molecules and exotic materials, and also explore fundamental physics in new ways. For example, by simulating high energy collisions of elementary particles, or the quantum behavior of a black hole, or the properties of the early universe right after the Big Bang. Of course, Laughlin and Pines knew that Feynman had made this proposal, but they dismissed the idea as impractical. And in fact, it's been 37 years since Feynman made this call for the launch of the field of quantum computing, and we're just now getting to the stage where quantum computers are capable, we hope, of doing interesting things. So why is it so hard and why is it taken so long? Well, in a quantum computer, we want some features that are almost mutually exclusive. We want the qubits to interact strongly with one another so we can process the information that they encode. But we don't want the qubits to interact with the environment because that would drive decoherence, which would cause the quantum computing to, be, to fail. Except we do want to be able to control the qubits from outside and eventually read them out. And it's very hard to devise a physical system that meets all of these desiderata. And it's only after decades of work improving materials and fabrication and control technologies and qubit design that we've gotten as far as we have. So where are we? We're at kind of a pivotal stage in the history of technology on our planet. We think we're on the brink of quantum supremacy, that is, being able to use quantum devices to perform tasks which surpass what we can do with the most powerful existing classical technologies. And I thought we should have a word for this impending new era that's opening up. So in my talk last year, I made up a word, NISC. It means noisy intermediate scale quantum. 
Intermediate scale refers to the number of qubits, greater than 50, say, such that we will be unable by brute force to simulate what a quantum computer is doing with our most powerful classical computers. But Noisy reminds us that these devices will be imperfect, the gates that they perform will have errors, and that will limit the computational power of this NISC-era technology. Now, physicists are excited about NISC because it's opening new opportunities for exploring the properties of highly entangled matter. And it might have applications of broader interest, but we're not sure about that yet. We shouldn't expect NISC to change the world by itself. It's a step toward more powerful technologies that we hope to see coming to fruition in the future. I'm confident that quantum technologies will have a transformative effect on human society, but we're not sure when, there's, when that's going to happen. It could conceivably still be decades away. Now we care about not just the number of qubits in a device, but also about their quality. And in particular, we care about the accuracy of the entangling two qubit gates that we perform in a quantum computer. And now, with the best devices under the best conditions, a quantum computer will make an error when it performs a thousand gates. And we haven't yet seen error rates that low in multi-qubit devices that are now being built. So that means naively, and it might be too naive because we could build some noise resistance into the algorithm that we run for some problems, but naively you wouldn't expect to be able to execute a quantum circuit with many more than a thousand gates without the signal in the readout being overwhelmed by the noise. Now we understand in principle how we'll do better eventually by using quantum error correction to protect against the noise and perhaps also we'll find qubit technologies which mu with much lower physical error rates, and maybe both will happen, but probably those developments won't occur very soon. Now I emphasize that we don't expect a quantum computer to find exact solutions to worst case instances of hard combinatorial optimization problems. But it's possible that they'll be able to find better approximate solutions or to find approximate solutions faster. And there's an emerging paradigm of how a quantum computer could be used together with a classical computer to solve optimization problems, a kind of hybrid quantum classical scheme where a quantum computer would execute a circuit of modest size, the qubits would be measured, those measurement outcomes would then be fed to a classical computer which would return instructions about how to slightly modify the quantum circuit, and that procedure would be iterated with the goal of finding the optimal value of some cost function for the purpose of solving approximately an optimization problem. That can be applied to classical combinatorial optimization problems, in which case uh, it's sometimes called the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. And it can also be applied to quantum problems, finding low energy states of many particle quantum systems, in which case it's sometimes called a variational quantum eigensolver. But in either case, the procedure is similar. So should we expect these NISC era devices by this hybrid scheme to be able to outperform our best classical methods for solving these problems? Well, we don't know. We'll have to try it and see how well it works, but it's really a lot to ask because the classical methods have been well honed over decades of development and our quantum attempts to solve these problems are just beginning. Now I mentioned 50 qubits as a kind of milestone for quantum computing, but in fact we already have machines with many more qubits, in particular the quantum annealer, which is made by D-Wave systems. Now, quantum annealing is a different paradigm than circuit-based quantum computing for solving problems, but a quantum annealer can be used for solving optimization problems, and it does solve them. But as of now, we don't yet have convincing theoretical arguments that quantum annealers can solve uh, problems faster than 
the best classical systems running the best algorithms attacking the same problems, nor have such speedups been persuasively demonstrated. So far, the quantum annealers that have been available are what we call stochastic. Uh, coming soon are non-stochastic quantum annealers, which may have greater potential, some theorists believe, for producing interesting speedups. But the theorists haven't so far been very successful at characterizing the power of quantum annealers, so we're going to have to experiment with them further to understand what potential advantages they might have. Quantum machine learning is in many ways transforming technology and it's also having a big impact on the way we do science. It's natural to wonder about the potential of combining machine learning with quantum technology. Maybe a quantum network would for some purposes be easier to train than its classical counterpart. Well, we don't really know whether that's true, but we can try it and see how well it works. One reason for being hopeful about the potential of quantum machine learning is that we know it's possible in principle to encode a lot of classical data very succinctly in a relatively small number of qubits. That's what we call QRAM, quantum random access memory. And that might have advantages, but many of the proposed ideas for using quantum machine learning are hampered by an input-output bottleneck. That is, loading classical data into QRAM is a slow process, and that can nullify the potential advantage of the quantum processing. And the output from a quantum network is a quantum state, and we can only access a limited amount of information by measuring it in a single shot. It may be the natural way to think about quantum machine learning as a scheme where both the input and the output are quantum states, which can be used for some quantum purpose. For example, trying to find a better way to characterize or control a quantum system, including a quantum computer. Where we might expect a quantum network to have an advantage over a classical one is when it's trying to learn about a joint probability distribution in which entanglement has an underlying role, in other words, for quantum problems. Now, physicists are excited, as I've said, about using quantum computers for quantum simulation. The problems that we encounter when dealing with many strongly correlated particles in chemistry and uh, material science are, we believe, hard classically. We think that's true because people have tried so hard to solve them on classical computers and have not been successful. And quantum computers will be able to do these simulations. Though it might be that we'll need to wait for the scalable fault-tolerant quantum computer, which is error-corrected, in order to solve those problems, and we don't know how far off that is. The potential long-term impact of advances in chemistry and materials that might result is far-reaching, but it's not likely that that potential will be fully realized by NISC-era devices. Classical computers are particularly bad at simulating quantum dynamics, at simulating the dynamics of highly entangled systems. And there we think quantum computers will have a big advantage. And physicists are hoping to learn interesting things about quantum dynamics during the NISC era. It might be instructive to recall that back in the 60s and 70s, when it first became possible to simulate chaotic dynamical systems, with classical computers that led to considerable advances in our understanding of classical chaos, that is the sensitivity to initial data that uh, prevents us from being able to predict the weather more than about 10 days out. We understand comparatively little about chaos in quantum systems because they've been too hard to simulate and perhaps with systems of order 100 qubits we'll get new insights into quantum chaotic dynamics. There are really two types of quantum simulators, the analog and the digital type. By an analog quantum simulator, I mean a quantum system with many qubits whose dynamics resembles the dynamics of some model system that we're interested in studying, whereas a digital quantum computer is a gate-based universal quantum computer which can be used to simulate any physical system of interest 
if we program it suitably. And analog quantum simulation has been a very active area of research for over 15 years, while digital quantum simulation is really just starting to take off now. Many of the same experimental platforms, in fact, can be used for both purposes. Now, analog simulators have limited control over the Hamiltonian of interest, and that puts some limitations on their power. And we can anticipate that in the long run, analog quantum simulation will be surpassed by digital quantum simulation, as occurred in classical computing. But that might not be for quite a long time. So in thinking about the near-term impact of quantum devices, we shouldn't overlook the potential of analog quantum simulation. Well, as I've said, our NISC era quantum devices won't be protected by quantum error correction, and the noise will limit the size of the quantum computations that we can execute. Eventually, quantum error correction will allow us to go further. But quantum error correction carries a quite high cost in overhead in both the number of qubits that we need and the number of gates needed to perform a computation. Now, how high that cost is depends on the quality of the hardware that we use and the complexity of the algorithm that we're trying to carry out. But with today's hardware, if we're trying to solve a chemistry problem which surpasses what we can solve classically, uh, that may require hundreds of logical qubits which are error corrected by encoding each one of those logical qubits in thousands of physical qubits. So to reach that scalable era, we're going to have to cross a very daunting quantum chasm from where we'll be in the next few years with perhaps hundreds of physical qubits to systems with millions of physical qubits, and that's going to take some time. We'll need advances in the technology of the qubit, in systems engineering, better design of fault-tolerant protocols. All these things can help to bring us closer to the era of the fully fault-tolerant, scalable quantum computer. Okay, now let me shift gears and talk about how we're going to protect our privacy in the quantum era. The first quantum algorithm that caused very widespread excitement, the first algorithm that really uh, ignited interest in the subject, was Shor's algorithm, which can be used to break widely used public key crypto systems like RSA and elliptic curve cryptography. But that will require an error-corrected computer with thousands of logical qubits, so you may not have to worry about such attacks on these quantum systems for some time. But really, there are three timescales to consider. One is how long you think it's going to take for quantum adversaries to be able to run Shor's algorithm and break RSA, for example. But we should also keep in mind how long it will take to implement quantum-safe alternatives to the public key, public key schemes that we currently use. And we should also ask how long we want our keys to remain secure. So if you believe it might take 15 years to put an alternative quantum safe scheme in place and you'd like your keys to be protected for another 20 years after that, for example, then that would mean you should worry if you think an adversary might be able to run Shor's algorithm in 35 years. And no one can assure you that that's not the case. So what's the solution going to be? Well, there are two different types of solutions. One is what we call post-quantum cryptography, and that means we can continue to use our conventional classical communication hardware, but running new crypto systems based on different assumptions about computational hardness than those underlying RSA. And the other is quantum cryptography, where we use the property of quantum physics that you can't eavesdrop on a quantum signal without producing a detectable disturbance to distribute keys. But there, no computational assumptions are required, but we need to build a new communications infrastructure which can be used to send quantum signals. So some users might be satisfied with option A, but some might insist on B. So we can anticipate that both A and B will be part of our quantum safe future. 
Further research on quantum resistant crypto systems will strengthen the case for A and eventually we'll need to adopt standards and that's going to take time to realize and implement. Advances in the distance scale over which we can distribute quantum keys, either using quantum repeaters or satellites for distribution of entanglement, will strengthen the case for B. But either way, if you're a cryptographer who's worried about protecting our privacy decades into the future, you need to be quantum savvy nowadays. Now, if we are going to use quantum networks to generate shared keys, what is a quantum network? It has four elements. It has end nodes where we can uh, send and receive quantum signals, a quantum channel to connect the nodes, quantum repeaters to extend, extend the range uh, between sending and receipt, and also classical channels which are used to complete the protocols. The quantum channel could be most likely photons sent either through free space or in optical fiber. But there are losses either way, in particular in optical fiber, there hasn't been much improvement in the last 20 years in how much photon loss there is. So now if you send 50 photons through an optical fiber that's 100 kilometers long, one of those 50 will get through. And if you try to send the photons through 1,000 kilometers of fiber, one in 10 to the 17 will get through. So if we want to extend the range, uh, the two main ideas that are discussed are either satellite-based, where a satellite flying overhead distributes entanglement to separated points on the ground, or ground-based, which requires quantum repeaters to extend the range. A quantum repeater performs a kind of quantum error correction, so it requires a quantum memory and some quantum processing capability, but it's not nearly as sophisticated as the quantum error correction that we would need to make quantum computing scalable. Just the same, the technology doesn't yet exist. A nice thing about quantum cryptography is that while we'll always have to worry about side channel attacks or intruders who enter the nodes, we don't have to trust the equipment that's used at the nodes to send and receive the signals because quantum mechanics gives us ways of self-testing the devices to make sure they're really doing what they're supposed to be doing. Part of the technology that we might need to develop is transducers, which can take the quantum signals which travel over the fiber and in free space and convert them to qubits that can be stored in memory and conveniently processed. Eventually, we can anticipate other applications for quantum networks aside from cryptography. For example, networks of quantum computers or sensors, which can uh, communicate one another um, for either purposes of security or higher sensitivity. But in the nearer term, the main incentive for developing quantum networks is cryptography. So let's talk about sensing a little bit. One remarkable sensor which makes use of quantum coherence is what we call an NV center, a nitrogen vacancy color center in diamond. And it can be used for scanning probe microscopy with impressive resolution for imaging at the nanoscale. And what makes it so convenient is that although it really has a coherent qubit, the coherence time is long, even at room temperature, and it can be addressed optically with lasers, which is very convenient. Now, applications of such sensors include non-invasive sensing of biomagnetism in living cells, including bacteria or human cells, or observing the firing of a single neuron. And more broadly, in vivo detection of small changes at the cellular or even the molecular level, potentially, for example, detecting damage in cells. Now, this type of high-resolution sensing has other applications as well, for example, it can be used to explore the properties of materials, looking at, in particular, the structure of defects in materials, and that can help to um, assist with the development of new advanced materials. And incidentally, those advanced materials might themselves have further applications in quantum sensing by enabling a multi-qubit sensing platform to uh, include entanglement or communication among the sensors. Another 
application arena for sensing is positioning, navigation, and timing. Uh, the flagship uh, PNT technology is a global positioning system. But one thing you can wonder about is uh, what happens when GPS is not available. And for that purpose, it's important to have very high sensitivity inertial sensors which can detect linear acceleration or rotation. And those same technologies can also be used for measuring accurately the Earth's gravitational field or gradients in the field, which can be used for geophysical surveying, looking for things underground. And quantum technologies uh, provide the, uh, the best means for performing this kind of sensing for example, with atom interferometers and also superconducting and optomechanical devices. We've already seen a lot of economic impact of atomic clocks and quantum magnetometers, um, and we can anticipate that there will be quantum enhancements using more advanced quantum technologies like entanglement squeezing and error correction, which will have an economic impact in the future. And in the longer term, we may have hybrid quantum technologies which combine sensing with qubit storage, communication, and processing. So what will this next generation quantum sensing uh, take advantage of? Well, as we've known for some time, by taking advantage of quantum entanglement, one can improve the sensitivity of a multi-qubit device if we have n qubits in a sensor and they are not entangled with one another, then the sensitivity to a signal improves like one over the square root of n. But if the sensors are entangled, that can be improved to a one over n scaling. The catch is that improved sensitivity to, uh, let's say, some weak force that we're trying to measure uh, comes along with increased sensitivity to noise in the environment, which shortens the coherence time and interferes with the protocol. So it's actually a quite subtle matter to find multi-qubit quantum states which are suitable for enhancing sensing. And that actually might be an interesting task for quantum machine learning to find such states. Another idea is quantum radar in which a pair of entangled photons is prepared. One of them stays home while the other goes off and bounces off of a target, and then when the photons are recombined, the reflected photon can be detected with improved sensitivity compared to one that had not been entangled. In the longer term, we can envision, um, for example, long baseline quantum interferometry enabled by quantum technology. If we have telescopes that are distantly separated, with shared entanglement produced by a quantum network, then that enables the telescopes to teleport photons back and forth with one another. So if we stretch our imaginations a little, we might envision an array of telescopes in solar orbit connected through some quantum network with shared entanglement, which would enable them to use the radius of the Earth's orbit around the sun, say, as a baseline for interferometry, which would mean you'd be able to see an object the size of an elephant on a planet 10 light years away. It would have to be a very brightly shining elephant, though. In order to make these advances occur, many things will be needed, including better materials, longer coherence times, more precise coherent control over qubits, more efficient readout, robust and compact platforms, but most of all, new ideas about how these capabilities can be applied. Well, here's my favorite quantum sensing example, and I'm not um, presenting it as a commercial opportunity, but just because I think it gives an indication of how incremental advances in sensitivity can lead to transformative changes. Five billion years ago, about five billion light years away, two black holes collided and merged. They had a total solar mass of 
uh, a total mass of 85 solar masses. They radiated away five solar masses in gravitational radiation. And last year, that gravitational wave washed over the Earth. So what did it do to us? It stretched and compressed the Earth by a distance, which is about the diameter of an atomic nucleus. And it sounds absurd to suggest that we could detect that, but we did. It was detected by LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's an interferometer with arms that are four kilometers long. Now, LIGO is really a quantum limited sensor it can detect signals in a certain frequency range, and the shortest structure that it can see in the signal in time is about one millisecond. And in that frequency band, it's limited by a quantum effect, but we can improve the sensitivity by means of squeezing. Squeezing means increasing the sensitivity to some variable that we care about at the cost of decreasing sensitivity to a com complementary observable that we don't care about. And it's currently planned that in their next observing run, LIGO will make use of squeezing, and that will extend their frequency window to uh, slightly higher frequencies, or in other words, the time resolution to less than a millisecond. And that's very interesting scientifically because if two neutron stars collide and merge, and one such event has been detected so far, the signal at the time scale of about a millisecond encodes information about the nature of the nuclear fluid of the two coalescing stars, and we don't really know very much about the behavior of nuclear matter um, in that or, or any other setting. In fact, it's a very hard computational problem to simulate nuclear matter, and someday, I think we'll do that with quantum computers. So this squeezing is going to um, enhance, it is hoped, the sensitivity of LIGO by a, by a relatively small factor in the frequency band of interest, uh, maybe something like a factor of two. But a factor of two in sensitivity is a big deal because it means you can sense in a volume which is eight times larger. And in the last month of its previous observing run, LIGO detected four black hole mergers. If it can increase the sensitivity by a factor of two, we should be seeing black holes all over the universe colliding and merging about once a day. Now, I'd like to uh, mention a couple of recent developments in quantum simulation, which maybe are, are somewhat encouraging about what we can expect in the future. One thing physicists are very interested in is how quantum systems, which are initially far from equilibrium, converge to thermal equilibrium. And in many systems, that convergence to thermal equilibrium is very rapid, which is why thermal equilibrium provides a good description of many phenomena. The systems that thermalize quickly have very rapid entanglement dynamics. So if you produce some local perturbation in the system, it spreads very quickly and the information that you put into the system becomes hidden among the entanglement of many particles. But some systems have the opposite behavior. If they're sufficiently disordered, they are what we call localized, and they thermalize very slowly. In experiments last year done by the Harvard group with a 51 atom quantum simulator, essentially a, a 51 qubit analog quantum device, they discovered a kind of intermediate behavior of phase of matter in which some quantum states thermalize quickly and others undergo coherent oscillations that last for a very long time and therefore converge to equilibrium very slowly. And it's kind of remarkable that this is the case because these two types of states otherwise look very similar and this phenomenon had not been anticipated so it put the theorists to work and there are proposals now about how this might be the first indication of a phenomenon not seen before called quantum many body scars in a chaotic quantum system. So I think it's very encouraging that this platform, which was one of the first to explore quantum dynamics in a regime which arguably is at the edge of what we can simulate classically, found a new phenomenon that hadn't been anticipated. 
Another thing I'd like to mention is programmable analog quantum simulators, a kind of intermediate case between the extremes of analog simulation and digital simulation. And by that I mean a simulator which doesn't execute a circuit of quantum gates, but has a Hamiltonian that can be rapidly tuned during a run. Um, and so we can, in one experiment, change the Hamiltonian multiple times. Now there are control errors in the Hamiltonian. We can't control it precisely. But those errors are, to a large extent, reproducible. So even though we don't know exactly what the Hamiltonian is, it can still be a powerful tool for performing variational tasks. For example, finding low energy states of a quantum system. And we could consider, say, switching uh, several times the Hamiltonian during a single run, where the time that Hamiltonian 1, Hamiltonian 2, and so on are on are variational parameters. And we can try to optimize with respect to those parameters when uh, we measure the energy. And uh, such an experiment was done this year, just recently reported by uh, the Innsbruck group in an ion trap. And they obtained very impressive results for a 20 qubit device, which was simulating quantum electrodynamics in one dimension. It was a small enough system so they could compare with exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian and see that the results were good. But also their protocol has some self-verification built in because they can also measure the variance of the energy. And if we find an eigenstate of the energy, there, there should be no variance. And they were able to check that at special values of the energy, that variance of the energy goes to zero. And so then they knew they were sitting on an energy eigenvalue of the system. And this type of experiment should be feasible with the current technology for, say, 50 ions. And the Innsbruck group has plans to scale up. Now, it's not clear that this type of computation on a longer system will really give us information we can't access classically. But the same type of platform studying two-dimensional systems might be able to teach us new things. So let me sum up. We'd like to know if these intermediate scale NISC technologies will be able to, for some purposes, surpass our best classical computers. Well, we don't know whether that's going to be possible. We're going to have to try it and see how it works. And in particular, we'll be able to test these hybrid classical quantum algorithms, like the quantum approximate optimization algorithm and the variational quantum eigensolver, and also seek other ways of using classical and quantum power together in some type of optimization scheme. Quantum dynamics is especially hard to simulate, and therefore it's a particularly tempting arena for finding quantum advantage. We shouldn't expect NISC to change the world all by itself. Really, realistically, our goal should be to pave the way for bigger payoffs that can be realized in future devices. It's very valuable to continue to lower the gate error rates in quantum computers. That will enable us to execute larger circuits in the NISC era, and eventually it will lower the overhead cost of implementing quantum error correction. The world should be worrying now about how to have quantum safe privacy. It's an urgent issue. We should expect quantum sensing, networking, and computing to all advance together. And in particular, potentially next generation quantum sensors will provide us with unprecedented capabilities, potentially of commercial interest. The really transformative quantum computing technology will probably need to be fault tolerant. And so that might still be a ways off. We're not sure how long it's going to take to get there, but it's very important to make progress in that direction in our current uh, quantum technological path. And finally, one last remark. Uh, the um, National Academy report that I mentioned at the beginning uh, emphasizes the need for a virtuous cycle. We're trying to develop a really hard technology, and for that purpose, we would like to have in the near term some stream of revenue which will encourage industry to reinvest and continue to develop more powerful technologies. 
So it's extremely valuable and vitally important to have meetings like this one where we explore the potential of those near-term technologies. Thanks for listening. So am I supposed to take questions? Okay, questions. Can't really see you, but uh, it doesn't matter because there are no questions. Oh, hi. Hi. So what is your opinion about continuous variable quantum computing using on-chip photonics? So the question was, what's my opinion of continuous variable uh, quantum computing? So uh, in particular, I, keep I kept talking about qubits. And I think the question is, can we do uh, quantum information processing and perform powerful tasks using, say, harmonic oscillators? on which we can do coherent processing. Well, I mean, I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing to explore. And in particular, um, well, I mean, in the long run, uh, we could use that continuous variable technology. But if we want to error correct it, we would probably need to encode, almost certainly, we would need to encode finite dimensional quantum systems in those continuous variable systems. But in the near term, I think as an approach to analog quantum simulation, it's certainly something that has promise. Um, John? Yeah. So years ago, Feynman was also quoted as mentioning how mysterious quantum mechanics is and how difficult it is to understand that no one may actually understand it. Do you think that the technologies you've discussed today will give us insights into why quantum mechanics behaves the way it does, not just as a means to an application end, but as a deeper understanding. Right, so I think the question is, do we expect, uh, as quantum technology progresses, to get unprecedented insights into the foundations of quantum mechanics and get a better understanding of why it is the way it is? Uh, well, it's not, I can't rule it out. I mean, I'm not sure we're supposed to understand why it is the way it is. It just is the way it is. And maybe it'll turn out not to be the way we think it is. And of course, that would be extremely interesting. Um, you know, I think part of what Feynman was saying is that the, he was trying to emphasize that the quantum world is so different from the classical world of ordinary experience. And, and that's true. And yet, uh, you know, uh, we as practicing quantum physicists or quantum algorithms designers understand the rules and we know how to make use of the rules. And of course, Feynman made very good use of the rules uh, in his own work. Uh, nevertheless, I think having some visceral, intuitive grasp of quantum physics is very important for advancing science and advancing computing. And you acquire that through experience. And one thing that I think will be very interesting and uh, maybe a potential arena that can be exploited commercially is um, letting kids play with quantum games when they're young. If you have experience with the way quantum systems behave and it's part of the way you grow up, I think maybe you will acquire a more visceral understanding than uh, those of us who are older and had to learn quantum mechanics when we were already in college. There's one over here, I think. Hey, thanks, John. Uh, you mentioned quantum chaos as one of the potential study objects. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, um, if you perturb the starting state a little bit, but the but the quantum circuit has error, even if uh, it is under the uh, fault tolerant regime, but wouldn't this error uh, dominate the starting perturbation? so that you won't get anything interesting for studying quantum chaos? So I, I'm not sure I got the whole question, but was your, were you saying that because of the linearity of quantum mechanics? No, because of the error. Because of the error oh, in, I see. in the, in the uh, quantum gates. Although it's very small, and you, maybe you can apply quantum error correction, but still, you know, it's not the unitary operation that you want to have. Then this error, uh, you know, it's, it's larger than 
this very small perturbation yeah. in the initial state, then wouldn't this you know, totally ruin the purpose of studying the chaos? Yeah, so the question is, um, if we have imperfect control, isn't it impossible to explore quantum chaos because the effects of quantum chaos will be overwhelmed by noise? No, I think, I think um, as with other uh, settings in quantum simulation, it's, it's a battle you know, between the noise and the underlying physics. And in fact, I didn't have time to mention it, but a rather uh, active area in the last year or two has been uh, suggesting, and a few experiments have been carried out, uh, ways of exploring quantum chaos. Uh, well, I guess I won't go into the technical side of that, but basically what you can do is you can let a system uh, evolve forward in time, and then hit it with the perturbation and try to evolve it backward in time and see how much different it is than the initial state. And, uh, you know, it's just a question of, of how noisy and uh, how much information you can extract. I, I don't think it's a fundamental obstacle that there's noise if we want to study quantum chaos. Over here, John. So if you could gather half of all of, right here, John. Where are Front, you? over here, keep coming. Yep, right here. Oh, the hey. Yep, sorry, <laughs> bright lights. Uh, if you could gather half of all of the capital in the world that's going into quantum computing and put it into one thing, one area, not into Caltech's labs, let's say, <laughs> but if you could put it into one area of the abstraction layer, you could put it into one vector, where would you put it? <clears throat> I want better qubits. I mean, in the long run, that's uh, going to make quantum computing far more powerful. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, in the last slide, uh, you mentioned that uh, um, quantum sensing, networking, and computing will advance together. Uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit more? And, uh, also, what would you recommend to industry uh, to approach on these areas? So the question is, what did I mean when I said quantum networking, sensing, and computing will advance together? Well, uh, let's think about what are, the, you know, what are the limitations on what we can do now. In the case of quantum networking, a serious limitation is we don't really have a practical quantum repeater technology. But uh, that is a task which can be performed if we can, um, you know, uh, store and coherently process signals and capture, um, let's say, photons in a quantum device so they can be coherently processed. That same type of technology is going to be important, very likely, for scaling up quantum computing because uh, at least a possible architecture for a large-scale quantum computer is that it will have uh, many modules which are connected together by quantum channels, maybe photonic channels. So getting quantum information to go from one module of a quantum computer to another is very similar to quantum communication in a quantum network. And as for sensing, I was uh, you know, making the suggestion that our ability to coherently control many qubits can enhance sensing. And it's going to be hard to figure out how to do that right. But with a quantum processor, we may get uh, guidance about how to build a better um, sensor. And there, there are many other examples. Hi. Uh, I, have, I had a question about the um, taking off on the Schringer model that you mentioned. How well do you think we would be able to simulate quantum field theories um, in the near term? And do you think that uh, you know simulating theories may be more complicated than the Schringer model, something like quantum chromodynamics or actual nuclear matter, uh, <clears throat> whether that's something we would be able to do uh, anytime soon using noisy qubits? Yeah, so the, the question is whether we'll be able to use noisy qubits in the relatively near term to simulate quantum field theories, including quantum chromodynamics, which is a great computational challenge. It's a uh, quantum chromodynamics is the theory of strongly interacting matter. I, I mentioned it 
in passing, when I said we don't know how to simulate nuclear matter, that's a problem in quantum chromodynamics, another situation where we know the exact equations, but they're just too hard to solve. And, well, and the short answer is I'm not very optimistic about, for example, learning something about QCD during uh, the NISC era, but I think now we should be moving in that direction. At least for a physicist, it's a very important application. In computational physics, simulating QCD is a task that involves a community of hundreds of people and some of the most powerful computing systems in the world are used for that purpose. Of course, they're doing classical simulations and very successfully of some properties of QCD, like there are very good results now on the mass spectrum of the, uh, the low-lying, uh, strongly interacting particles. But what they're not able to do is simulate dynamics. So that, I think, is the big opportunity in quantum chromodynamics, nor can they simulate uh, matter at a non-zero uh, chemical potential. Uh, those problems have what we call a sign problem, and so uh, you can't uh, do Monte Carlo simulations on a classical computer uh, to get good answers. As far as I can tell, to simulate dynamics, we're going to need error-corrected quantum computers. But, um, you know, as with quantum simulation in general, we should make our first steps in that direction in the NISC era. Thank you very, very much. All right, John. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.